Media Masters presents Clifford Warren on how to read the Bible aloud. Hello. In an election campaign, a heckler shouted at the politician, And what are you going to do about housing? And the politician replied, Put an H on it. A congregation felt like calling to the Bible reader, Put an H on it, when he read what sounded like, Praise the Lord with all your art. But the reader had read the psalm correctly. The words were, Praise the Lord with all your art. A-R-T. The psalmist was urging the choir and musicians to praise the Lord with all their art, or, as the Amplified Bible puts it, with understanding and skill. With understanding and skill. That's the way the psalm should be presented. That's the way we should present all Scripture. First, with understanding. Don't read the Scriptures aloud to others unless you understand what you read, because the reader's task is to communicate to the audience the meaning of the text. You can't do this if you don't understand what you read. What the reader fails to see, the reader fails to communicate. For example, Jesus told us the reaction of the older brother when the prodigal son returned home. The older brother needled the father, and the father gently rebuked the older brother. You find this in their dialogue when the older brother says to his father, And when this son of yours comes home, and his father answers him, We had to celebrate, because this brother of yours. If you see this, you'll communicate it. If you don't see it, you won't communicate it. At the Last Supper, Jesus broke the news that one of the disciples would betray him. Eleven men asked, Lord, am I the one? One man asked, Teacher, am I the one? Nowhere in Scripture does Judas ever call Jesus Lord. If you see the difference, you'll communicate it. The crowd asked Jesus, What must we do to perform the works that God demands. And Jesus answered, The work that God demands of you is this, Believe in the messenger whom he has sent. See the difference between works and work, and let the audience hear the difference. If you don't see it, you won't communicate it. The first rule of comedy is, Don't tell a joke unless you understand it. Young Christopher heard his dad tell some people this joke. The guards marched the prisoner up the steps to the scaffold, stood him in the middle of the trapdoor, fastened the rope around his neck and asked, Any last words? And the prisoner replied, Yeah, keep your trap shut. When the laughter died down, Christopher went over to another group and said to them, Dad just told a joke. They were going to hang a man, so they marched him up the steps onto the scaffold, stood him in the middle of the trap door, fastened the rope around his neck and asked any last words, and he said, Yeah, shut up. The group stared at Christopher while he learned the first rule of comedy. Don't tell a joke unless you understand it. That's also the first rule of reading aloud. Don't read it aloud unless you understand what you read. For what you fail to see, you fail to communicate. And when you misunderstand, you communicate your misunderstanding. No one is born with a given ability to read aloud, sound natural, and make the meaning clear. Before the reader can sound natural and make the meaning of the text clear, First, the reader must understand the text's many meanings. Some time ago, the Bible Society commissioned a famous English actor to read aloud an audio cassette of Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. The actor should have read Paul's greeting, 
I'm writing to all of you in Rome whom God loves and has called to be saints, that is, the Christians, all whom God loves and has called to be saints. On tape, the actor reads, I'm writing to all of you in Rome whom God loves and has called to be saints. By placing a pause after all of you in Rome, the reader converted the whole population, continuing to read that news of their faith had gone out to the whole world. He recorded for all to hear that he misunderstood what he read, for Paul was not addressing everyone in Rome, only the Christians. When the reader understands the text's meaning, the reader uses vocal skill to communicate those meanings. Now, why does the reader need skill? Because listeners do not realize the meaning of spoken words through the words alone. Listeners comprehend the meaning of spoken words through the reader's emphasis, phrasing, and expression. Correct emphasis natural phrasing and appropriate expression tell listeners the meaning of the reader's words. First, let's consider emphasis. In normal conversation, we emphasize certain words by raising their volume and pitch. We say those words a little louder and a little higher. Such emphasis communicates to our listeners the word's meaning. Take, for example, the sentence, I should tell him. Now, what word or words should the reader emphasize? If the reader reads, I should tell him, that means it's my responsibility to tell him. If the reader reads, I should tell him, but I won't. If the reader reads, I should tell him, that is what I should do. If the reader reads, I should tell him, but not necessarily others. Someone might read, I should tell him, he should tell me. There are five ways in which we read that sentence. Change the emphasis, and you change the meaning. So how do we know which word to emphasize? The meaning tells us the words to emphasize. First, understand the meaning, then emphasize those words which make that meaning clear. Now here's an example from the Bible. We preach Christ to all men. How should we read it? We preach Christ to all men, contrasting ourselves with others. We preach Christ to all men. Preaching is our way of presenting Christ. We preach Christ to to all men. Christ is the subject of our preaching. We preach Christ to all men. We're the men's society. We're not addressing the women. Unless we understand all the ideas in the passage we read, we won't necessarily emphasize the correct words. Meaning tells the reader what to emphasize. The reader's emphasis tells the listeners the meaning. Now what happens when the reader emphasizes a wrong word? The reader will hide the meaning, confuse the meaning, or even worse, change the meaning. A congregation was amused when they heard a reader reading from 1 Kings. He should have read, he said, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass. What the reader read was, he said, saddle me, the ass. So they saddled him, the ass. And he made an ass of himself. On radio, a preacher read, He loved the good things of this life. And why shouldn't we all love the good things of this life? What we were meant to understand was, He loved the good things of this life, conveying the idea that he preferred not the spiritual life, but the earthly one. This gives a very different meaning. You may well ask, well, shouldn't the audience make out the meaning for themselves? The moment people start asking themselves, what was that? What did he say? They miss the next sentence and lose the thread of the reading. 
The second way the reader reveals the text's meaning is by phrasing. Using pauses, the reader groups together related words. Instead of gabbling, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, the reader reads, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Pauses divide the text into phrases. Phrases reveal the meaning. Now what happens when the reader pauses in the wrong place? Disaster. The reader may hide the meaning, confuse the meaning, or even change the meaning. Here are some examples of what happens when readers pause in wrong places. An English actor on audio cassette reads, Jesus got into the boat. It belonged to Simon and told him to push off a little from the shore. No, no. Jesus didn't tell Simon to push off. He told him to push off a little from the shore. A broadcaster speaking on etiquette should have read, When dining in a restaurant, never break your bread or roll in the soup. Unfortunately, the lady read, When dining in a restaurant, never break your bread or roll in the soup. Now that might be good etiquette, (laughs) but it wasn't what she meant. A clergyman's wife told a church meeting, My husband is a great lover of poetry. That's putting in a pause where a pause is not needed and creating unwanted amusement. The meaning of the text tells the reader how to phrase it, where to pause. The reader's phrasing tells the listeners the text's meaning. The third way the reader reveals the text meaning is through appropriate expression. Words have meanings. The true meaning of the words are found in the thought behind the words. The reader reveals the thought behind the words through appropriate expression. During World War II, when British troops boarded ship, their wives and families stood watching in silent tears. Often the loudspeakers on the wharf broadcast Vera Lynn's famous song, We'll Meet Again. Remember the words? We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Those lyrics were words of love and hope. Recently, a movie told of five bank robbers. One robber gave evidence against his associates in order that he might go free. Before the judge sentenced the other four, the judge addressed them, Before I pass sentence, do you have anything you wish to say? And the four culprits turned towards the informer and sang, We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. As the judge banged his gavel for order, the court knew that the lyrics were now words of resentment, and revenge. Words have meanings. The true meaning of words is found in the thought behind the words, and then communicated with appropriate expression. In the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to John, John reports that Jesus said to his opposition, If I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is not valid. And then in the 8th chapter of the Gospel, John has Jesus saying, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. Do these two statements contradict one another? (laughs) No. When Jesus says in the 5th chapter, If I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is not valid, he means, Now you're going to object that if I speak on my own behalf, My testimony is not valid. He is not stating his own viewpoint. He is stating the objection of his opposition. If the audience is to understand the meaning of these statements from chapters 5 and 8, then the reader must read each one with the appropriate expression. Like incorrect emphasis, 
and unnatural phrasing, inappropriate expression can hide the meaning of the text, confuse it, or even change it. Most times, lack of expression robs the reading of liveliness and emotion. The characters don't come to life, so the listeners fail to hear and see the wonderful personality of our Lord. His authority, patience, anger, compassion, courage, humility, and love do not come into sharp focus for them. When you read the Gospels aloud to people, what impression do they have of Jesus? Do they understand what he said, and why he said it? Or by your lack of expression, do they see him as a babbler of unintelligible words and phrases? At this point, someone might want to object, I don't think you should dramatize the scripture reading. There's a reader at our church who often turns on the dramatics at the lectern. I find it most embarrassing. Let's be clear. We're not talking about acting the text. We're talking about giving the text appropriate expression. The meaning of the text demands the appropriate expression if the audience is to understand the meaning. There's a big difference between an actor and a storyteller. The actor wants you to see him, for the play happens before your eyes. The storyteller wants you to see the story. It happens between your ears. The story is screened in the cinema of your imagination. Good storytellers will not do anything to disturb the audience's imagination. Anything the storyteller does to attract attention to self destroys the story in the listener's imagination. Now, readers are like storytellers, not like actors. Good readers don't draw attention to themselves. They want their listeners to see what they hear. Yes, we admit that occasionally there is some reader who tries to show off talent when asked to read the scriptures, and the result embarrasses us. That kind of reader is a small problem in our church. The great problem is the 99 other readers who week after week read the text without any expression and make the scripture sound meaningless and boring. The Irish professor said to his class, Never repeat for emphasis. I'll say that again. Never repeat for emphasis. I'm going to repeat. Let's sum up. Meaning matters most. The reader's first task is to understand the meaning in the text, then to communicate those meanings through correct emphasis, natural phrasing, and appropriate expression. Remember, what you see may be the word of God, but what you say is not always the word of God. The reason that the world believes that the Bible is dull, uninteresting, and irrelevant is not because they have read it. It's because they've heard Christians reading it. Slovenly, blundering, unskillful readers made the Bible a meaningless blur to them. A young clergyman, considering all we've just discussed together, protested, but are you saying that we shouldn't ask people to read aloud in church unless they have a clear understanding of the passage and the ability to read well? We have 75 people on the reading roster in our church. Reading scriptures occasionally gets them involved. It's the only thing some of them do in the life of our church. We suggested, well, most of them can probably thump out a tune on the piano. Why not roster them on the church organ as well? That would get them even more involved. He objected, Don't be stupid. That would spoil the music in our service. Of course it would spoil the music. He cares about spoiling music, but he doesn't care about spoiling the Word of God. Churches require ministers to complete a number of years' study of the Scriptures so that when they enter the pulpit, they will correctly interpret the Bible to the people. Yet they give the reading of the Bible 
to people who often don't understand what they read. Churches protect the pulpit, but they don't guard the lectern. A French politician was pleading with his parliament to make money available to train film producers, writers and directors. They provided money for defence, but not for arts. He got action from the French parliament when he pointed out, More damage will be done to France by tasteless films and bad television programmes than by the atomic bomb. The government then decided that they should make every effort to train people in their entertainment industry. More damage is done to the life of the church by incompetent readers than by any critics of the Bible. It's time to train our readers. St. Paul wrote to Timothy, Give time and effort to the public reading of Scripture. There are no shortcuts. Effective reading takes time and effort. The rewards go to those who persist. Clifford now talks about the art of pausing. Readers have four vocal tools. Volume, pace, pitch and pause. If a story becomes exciting the reader may increase the volume. If the story becomes suspenseful, the reader may decrease the volume. If a story becomes exciting, the reader may increase the pace. If the story becomes suspenseful or reflective, the reader may slow down the pace. If the story becomes exciting, readers may raise the pitch of their voices. If the story is sad or creepy, or confidential, the reader may lower the pitch. The meaning and mood of the text tell the reader what volume, pace and pitch to use. Now, wise readers use a moderate volume, pace and pitch, then they can increase or decrease them as the text requires. Let's look at that fourth tool. There are volume, pace pitch and pause, but the greatest of these is pause. The great English actor Sir Ralph Richardson was fond of saying, the pauses are the most precious things in the English language. The first important job which the pause does is break up the text into phrases. A phrase is a group of related words. A pause, a brief moment of silence, separates the phrases. Pauses give readers opportunities to take in breath, and the pause also helps the reader to glance ahead at the next phrase to be read. The pause gives the audience time to register the meaning of what was just read. Listen to these words without phrasing. In my opinion, whatever we have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future God has in store for us. Now here are the same words using pauses to break them into phrases. In my opinion, whatever we have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future God has for us. Another example, first, without pauses. In the light of the grace I have received, I want to urge each one among you not to exaggerate his real importance. Here it is with pauses breaking it into phrases. In the light of the grace I have received, I want to urge each one among you not to exaggerate his real importance. So pausing is essential to phrasing. How do you know where to pause? The meaning of the text tells you where to pause. This might be a good moment to correct a wrong impression some readers have about punctuation. I'm referring to readers who look to punctuation to tell them where to pause. Don't do it. The purpose of punctuation is to help you understand the text meaning. It's the meaning of the text which tells you where to pause. 
Consequently, you will pause many times where there are no punctuation marks, and sometimes you won't pause where there is a punctuation mark. Let's repeat the guideline. Punctuation helps you understand the meaning, and the meaning shows you where to pause. And it's a fact of life that you can't trust the punctuation in any text. If Agatha Christie, Shakespeare, or Bible translators don't make mistakes in their manuscripts, then the printer will. Well, that's the pauser's first job, to make phrases. But there's much, much more that a good pause can do for you. After the phrasing pause comes the separating pause. The separating pause helps the audience register a change of subject or a change of place or time. At the beginning of the eighth chapter of the Gospel according to John, John records about the Jewish leaders, And they all went home, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At daybreak, He appeared again in the temple, and all the people gathered round him. He had taken his seat and was engaged in teaching them, when the scribes and Pharisees brought in a woman caught committing adultery. That brief section needs a number of separating pauses to help the audience imagine the different locations and times. Next comes the pointer pause. The point of pause draws the audience's attention to an idea in the text. The English actor Paul Schofield was in a play, and in the play he was telling a story. In the story there was this line, And in the distance I heard a wolf. Now each night Schofield teased the audience in wanting to hear what it was that he heard, so he read that line, And in the distance I heard a wolf. And that point of pause focused the whole of the audience's attention on a wolf. One night, the prompter, that's the fellow who stands in the orchestra pit following the text in case an actor forgets, was sick. So they put in another man to do the prompting. And Schofield came to his line, and in the distance I heard. And the prompter whispered, A wolf! And upset his timing. So Schofield set the line up again. It was faint at first, but then there was no mistaking it. I heard, and the prompt called, A wolf! Schofield bent down, pretending to do up his shoelace, and said to the fellow in the pit, Will you shut up? I'm coming to the wolf. Do you remember that moment at the Last Supper, when Peter said to Jesus, I will lay down my life for you? And Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows... You will disown me three times. Usually you hear that line read, You will disown me three times. When you put in the point of pause, the audience sees that Peter is crushed first of all by, You will disown me, and then even further by, Three times. No wonder he doesn't say anything else through supper. Here's another point of pause from a story earlier in the Gospel when the devil is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And when he had exhausted every kind of temptation, the devil withdrew until his next opportunity. The pointing pause is a most effective tool. Sometimes the reader uses it to point to what he is about to say, Sometimes he uses it to point to what he has just said. How does the audience know which idea the reader is pointing to, the one before the pause or the one after the pause? The reader slows down on the phrase or word to be highlighted. 
Actors and people who read stories find the pause helpful when reading dialogue. When an actor reads a character's dialogue, he strives to give each speech first timeness. That is, to sound as if the character is thinking and saying these words for the first time. The English actress Dame Edith Evans was known for the beautiful first timeness she brought to the lines in a play. A young actress said to her, How do you know how to say those words so naturally? And she said, Well, my dear, I know that in life there are things that are easy to say, and there are things that are difficult to say. It's easy for me to say to you, You are beautiful. Because it's true, you know it, and the compliment pleases you. But if I have to tell you you have B.O., that's not so easy to say. So I go through my script and I say, that line will be easy to say, that line's difficult to say, that line's easy to say. That's not... That was one of the ways in which Dame Edith Evans added first-timeness to her dialogue. In normal conversation, we aren't always fluent we pause to think, to grab attention, to recall, to find the right word, etc. So when we read a character's dialogue, an occasional pause can give that speech first-timeness. In the Gospel according to John, chapter 9, John tells us about Jesus healing a man who had been born blind. Later, neighbours took him to the council of Pharisees, and they cross-examined him about what had happened to him. But the Pharisees wouldn't believe that he had been born blind, and he had received his sight, until they called his parents. Now the father apparently liked to go to synagogue, and the Pharisees had declared anybody who says Jesus is Messiah, out, excommunication. So he's a nervous old man. And the Pharisees ask, Is this man your son? Do you say that he was born blind? If so, how is it that he now can see? And the father answers, We know that he is our son, and we know that he was born blind. How it is he's now able to see, uh, he's old enough, ask him. Now the pausing adds to the first timeness. OK, it's time to summarise again. The phrasing pause helps the reader breathe and glance ahead of the text. The phrasing pause gives the audience time to register the meaning of what was just read. The separating pause gives the audience time to adjust and imagine when you change the subject or change the time or location. The pointing pause draws the audience's attention to ideas in the text. As well as pausing, reduce pace when reading the key idea to which you're pointing. The first timeless pause gives life to a character's dialogue and makes the speech sound natural. Next, how to read your text with the appropriate expression. Directors of stage, screen and television productions often say to their actors, don't just say words, Reveal the thought behind the words. In drama, actors know that the real meaning of each line of dialogue is not in the words themselves, the literal information they convey. There's more for the audience than mere surface meaning. The real meaning is in the under-meaning, the thought behind the words. Look at this dialogue. What time is it? It's only eleven o'clock. What do the words mean? Their surface meaning is obvious. What time is it means what's the hour of the day. It's eleven o'clock means it's the eleventh hour of the day.
But suppose the dialogue is spoken by a hungry boy and his mother, who's preparing lunch, then those words have much more to tell us. There are thoughts behind the words. When the boy asks, What time is it? He's really saying, How soon can we eat? I'm hungry. And when his mother answers, It's only eleven o'clock. She's telling him, It's not time for me to have the meal ready yet, so you'll have to be patient and wait for it. Now, supposing we have a scene inside a condemned cell. The prisoner asks the chaplain, What time is it? And the chaplain answers, It's eleven o'clock. The thought behind the prisoner's words might be, How long before I'm executed? The thought behind the chaplain's words might be, You have little time to get right with God. Now supposing during my rector's Sunday morning sermon, my son leans close and whispers, What time is it? And I say, It's eleven o'clock. That means we've missed the bus. Take the two words, Come here. They can be expressed to mean any of the following thoughts. Come here. Face me while I rebuke you. Come here. Let me comfort you. Come here. Please stop fooling around. Come here. I dare you to come near me. Come here. My patience is exhausted. Do as I tell you. Come here. I have a lovely surprise for you. Six undermeanings can change the expression of two words six times. You can use those words to command, to console, to correct, to challenge, to warn, or to promise. Your expression depends on the thought behind the words. Jesus' disciple Philip took the news to Nathanael, We've found the Messiah. He is Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. In the New English Bible, Nathanael's first word of reply was to repeat Nazareth. Now, how did he say it? With surprise? Nazareth? Or with agreement? Nazareth, yes, of course. Or with doubt? Nazareth? Uh, That doesn't sound right. No, the thought behind this word is Nazareth? You've got to be joking. Nathaniel is being sarcastic. That's the expression to use. Two kings use the same three words at the end of their stories. It is finished. When King Arthur says them, he means, I've lost. When Jesus shouts them from the cross, he means, I won. The expression in your voice must tell the audience the thought behind the words. If your reading lacks expression, you hide the meaning. Read with the wrong expression, and you will confuse the meaning or change the meaning. The meaning of the text tells you the thoughts behind the words and what vocal expression to use. Your expression tells the audience the thought behind the words and their true meaning. So prepare. Read, examine, study, and understand all the meanings in the text. Cross-check with other translations. When people go to the theatre, they don't buy expensive tickets to hear the actors read the words of a play. The audience pays to hear the actors reveal the thoughts behind those words. During rehearsals, Directors often rebuke actors, I hear what you're saying, but I don't know what you mean by what you're saying. The actor must know and think the thoughts behind the character's words, and so must the Bible reader. What our audience should hear is the thoughts behind the words of the Bible characters and their authors. How do you find the thought behind the words? 
There are some times when the gospel writers fear that we might misunderstand the thought behind a character's words, so they tell us the undermeaning of those words. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to John, Jesus faces a crowd of more than 5,000 people. He turns to his disciple Philip and asks him, Where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? The writer doesn't want us to think that the situation worries, puzzles, or distresses Jesus. So he tells us, Jesus said this to test Philip. Actually, he knew already what he would do. In John 12.5, Judas sees a woman anoint Jesus with an expensive perfume. So he asks, Why wasn't this perfume sold for three hundred silver coins and the money given to the poor? John then reveals the thought behind his words. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself to it. So the reader won't read Judas' line with true compassion in his voice. In Luke 9.33, Peter saw Jesus transfigured, and the Old Testament prophets Elijah and Moses appear with him. He stammered, Master, how good it is that we are here. We'll make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Luke explains he didn't really know what he was saying. There are many other examples where the gospel writer tells us the undermeaning. But most times, we have to realize it for ourselves. How do we discover these things? Is it by paraphrasing, restating what's written in your own words? No. Paraphrasing helps you understand the surface meaning of a word or phrase. It doesn't give you the thought behind the words. To see the undermeaning, you must know three things. What does the character want? Why does the character say this line? Why did the author write this story? First, what does the character want? Examine the text and discover what burning desire is the force which makes each character act and react the way they do. State it in specific terms. What stimulates the character to action? Bartimaeus wants to see again. Jairus wants to save his daughter from death. Four men want their paralyzed friend to walk again. These are easy examples. In other stories, a character's motivating force might not be so obvious. To find it takes time, study, and effort. The rewards go to those who persevere. In the fourth chapter of John, we read the famous encounter between Jesus and a much-married Samaritan woman. What does Jesus want in this situation? An early commentator, Ephraim the Syrian, read the whole chapter, from Jesus asking for a drink of water, to the Samaritans declaring, We know that he is the Saviour of the world and concluded, Jesus came to the well a hunter. He threw a crumb to a bird to attract the flock. Now what does the Samaritan woman want? From her dialogue, we would guess she has hung on the door of her life a please do not disturb sign. So the first clue as to the thought behind a character's words is found in what that character wants. Usually it's to possess something, or to be free of something. Now next, why does the character say this line? Dialogue in a story is not mere conversation. Dialogue is conversation with the dull bits left out. Every line has a purpose. Lines give audiences information about plot and character. To find the undermeaning, you must consider the character's purpose in saying what he does and what he wants to result from what he says. In Luke twenty twenty-seven to 40 Sadducees, who do not believe in the resurrection, interrupt Jesus as he speaks to the crowd. They ask his viewpoint on a problem. What motivates them? 
They want to destroy his credibility in front of the crowd. What do they want to result from what they say to him? They want to ridicule belief in the resurrection. If they can do this, then they can ridicule the teacher who believes in the resurrection. You must understand how each line serves to help the character who says it get what he wants. Then you must make that clear to the audience. If they don't see a line help the character accomplish a purpose, it sounds to them unnecessary or wrong. Lines must relate to their context, otherwise the audience finds them pointless or illogical. They want to know what the character is doing when he says a line. What is his verbal action? The Samaritan woman at the well, the one with the please do not disturb sign hanging on her life, took many verbal actions when she met the tired, thirsty Jew who asked her for a drink. Her first verbal action was to put him down. When he asked for a drink, she answered, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then her next verbal reaction was to heckle him. When he said, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She replied, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well's deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? When Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Then the woman uh, humoured him. She said, Sir, give me this water, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus fired a broadside. Go call your husband and come back. This time she cut him short. I have no husband. Jesus answered, You're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Her next verbal action is to change the subject and distract him. So she said, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Know what a character wants. Know why a character speaks a line. Know what verbal action the character is taking. Then, with the right expression, communicate those actions to the audience and watch them give you their attention. Even after you have found the undermeaning, and realize the verbal action, you might not fully grasp the significance of a line. You must also know how the lines serve the author's basic intention, and how they help the audience to see what's in the author's mind. In John 20.31, John tells us why he wrote his accounts of Jesus. These things are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in Him you may have life. So Nicodemus must learn that Jesus is more than a teacher come from God. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. The woman at the well has to learn that He is more than a prophet. He's the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. The crowd of over five thousand has to learn that He's more than an earthly king. He's the Messiah, the Son of God, and so do other characters in John's book. The stories also illustrate his other themes of faith and life. Now to summarise, the congregation does not come to hear the reader say aloud the words of the text. They come to hear the reader reveal the thoughts behind the words. How does the reader discover the thoughts behind the words? 
by understanding the text, by knowing what each character wants, why each character says each line, and what verbal action the character is taking, and by seeing how the lines relate to the author's purpose in writing the book. A professional photographer was listening to a tape recording of Ron Hadrick reading the Gospel of Mark from the Good News Bible. Later he said, It was a strange experience. I was hearing and understanding things I'd never seen before. And I read the Good News Bible every day. What made the difference? Hadrick's spoken reading gave him more than the words of Scripture. It gave him the thoughts behind the words. You too can communicate God's Word when you understand the text and use the right vocal expression. Antonio Stradivari, the famous maker of violins, instructed his craftsman, No violin leaves this workshop until it is as close to perfection as human skill and care can make it. If you can afford to buy a Stradivarius, you'd realise the standard of perfection they reached. When Stradivari was asked, Why this passion for perfection? He had only one answer. God needs violins to take his music to the world, and if my violins are defective, God's music is spoiled. These days, God needs readers to take his word to the world, and if your reading is defective, God's word is spoiled.